Senator McKim has submitted a proposal understanding Order 75 today, which has been circulated and shown on the dynamic red. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. You get the uh, clerks to set the clocks. And I call Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last year, about 130,000 public school kids finished up their final year of high school. That's 130,000 kids who have never experienced a public school that wasn't underfunded. For the entirety of their schooling life, it was always stretching money, cuts and layoffs. This year, another 100,000 or so public school kids will graduate also never going to a school that wasn't underfunded. And the year after that, and likely the year after that. This is a national crisis that is affecting kids today and of the future. Public schools are now underfunded by $6.6 billion a year. And yet since the original Gonski review, government funding to private schools has increased at double the rate to that of public schools. The major parties have withheld $26.9 billion from public schools and plugged that money into the private system. Public school investment in Australia is below the OECD average. But this funding shortfall is more than just numbers. Underfunding means classrooms built in the 70s that are filled with asbestos or mildew and mould. Underfunding means teachers working 12-hour days and covering the work of counsellors, administrators, social workers and educators all at once. Underfunding means these teachers are not paid for the hours they pour into marking and preparation, school events and excursions, overnights and weekends. Underfunding means one teacher for dozens of kids. It means broken laptops, out-of-date textbooks and parents footing the bills. Above all, underfunding means kids slipping through the cracks. It means failing. It means not setting them up for success and it means widening inequality in this country. Underfunding means that when NAPLAN results come out, it's not surprising that so many of our young people are struggling. Because when teachers and schools don't have the resources they need to support our most educationally disadvantaged students, results go down. And every time this happens, Labor and the Coalition start the distraction game. It must be our poorly trained teachers. Or maybe it's the way we teach reading. Or maybe it's naughty kids. Or bad parenting. Anything to distract the public's attention from the nub of the problem, which is chronic underfunding. Underfunding means a kick in the teeth for Australian egalitarianism. We are desperately running out of time. I hear time and again from teachers who are overworked and at the brink from comrades who are plugging holes and buying classroom resources and even food for their students, from parents who can't fathom what's happened to their local public schools, Australia and our kids are suffering for it. At every opportunity to fix this, Labor has folded. They backed off from Gonski, their crowning education achievement, and they backed off what it actually called for which is clawing money back from the private sector and putting it into the public one. Ten years later, the gap still remains. And money is pouring into the private sector. And now we have one of the most segregated school systems in the world. Right now, nearly every private school in this country is overfunded. And not only are they filled over and above the SRS with government money, they also charge huge fees on top of that. The public is literally paying for private schools to succeed. We are footing the bill for plunge pools and orchestra pits. We are footing the bill for these schools to charge exorbitant fees, fees that are locking out kids and locking in inequality. Right now, there is no pathway back. Labor needs to own up to its neoliberal mistakes and take responsibility for its role in Australia's surging inequality. That starts with rebuilding public education. This is the last chance we have to save our public schools. 
to truly deliver an equitable school system that gives every child a chance at a great life. The Labor government must fund all public schools to 100 per cent at the start of the next national school reform agreement, or they have consigned our public schools to collapse. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President. And this might sort of make a comment. Um, Senator Alman Payne um, is somebody who's, I know is very dedicated to make sure that the best outcomes are happening in our schools and a number of the Senate committees that I'm on. And she's a very important contributor there. Now, the Minister for Education has said that Australia has a good education system, but it needs a lot better and a lot fairer. Now, I agree that the funding is important. It's critical, and the government is committed to working with state and territory governments to get every school to 100 per cent of its fair funding level. Funding is critical. It is important. Now, the current National School Reform Agreement was signed off in 2018 by the member for Cook. Now, it speaks of waste, now, of course, that speaks of a wasted decade and missed opportunities in school education. The Productivity Commission, which I'll go to a bit later in my, my uh, lot of time, uh, was damning on its assessment of the former government's plan for school education, finding a series of deep-seated problems with the way that the system was operating. Now, last month, the Australian Education Research Organisation released a search that reveals that under the current agreement, very few students who start behind or fall behind catch up. Only about one in five students who are below the minimum standard in year three are above it in year nine. And of course, the coalition school agreement has not worked. This is a critical, fundamental problem that we're facing right at this moment. And that's why the Minister for Education said multiple times that funding is important, but so what it does is critical. Now, the agreement, um, the Commonwealth funding per student in government schools went up by 7 per cent over last year from $3,829 per student in 2022 to $4,096 in 2023. Now, critically, to make sure that we have the right funding, this includes an increase in funding for government schools from $10.6 billion in 2023 to $11.1 billion in 2024. And Commonwealth funding for government schools will continue to grow during the one-year extension of the current agreement. The critical um, issues that were raised by the review by the um, Productivity Commission and the present system and the difficulties and, make, and the need for reform, and they said, in, just for example, in uh, finding 3.1, the national policy initiatives, and they said, are like, unlikely to have affected the education outcomes of Australian students. So here, here we're putting a policy to affect the outcomes, to improve them, and they said there's a, a definite problem with regards to how those outcomes are being achieved. Now, while the design, and they went on to say, while the design of the unique uh, student identifier, for example, and the online form formative assessment tool has now been resolved, the agreed approaches do not appear to reflect the original ambition for and anticipated benefits of these MPIs. National data pro projects have pro progressed, but the majority are not complete. And of course, it went on to say to look at you know, the question of making sure that the right thing is done. And of course, the Libs just can't get it, couldn't get it right because in finding 3.2, the National School Reform Agreement has gaps that undermine its effectiveness in facilitating collective national efforts to lift student outcomes. And the shortfalls are incredibly important. The the, no outcome that captures well-being, a single weak target for academic achievement, a dearth of targeted reforms to lift outcomes for students from priority equity cohorts and for students who do not meet basic levels of literacy and numeracy, and a lack of transparent, independent and meaningful reporting on national and state reform activity, which means there is limited effective accountability. Now, I could go on to the other, the other um, issues with the Productivity Commission that they raised, but some of those starting results I've given you are important. But also, and I think uh, Senator Alman Payne uh, also touched on this, but the incredible um, long hours and the workload has increased substantially for teachers. Now, Australian teacher workload is greater than the OECD average. Australian teachers spend more time on non-teaching tasks and less time on teaching tasks than their international counterparts. Teacher workload has increased over time and many teachers 
cite heavy workload as a reason for wanting to leave the profession. There is a number of reforms that are critically important to make sure that we get this right. And part of those reforms are the discussions that are taking place with the, uh, the states and territories for their obligations and our funding to make sure, along with them, that we make sure that we get a better result for all students and all pa uh, parents and for teachers across the Australian community. Senator Henderson. I rise to speak today on this matter of public importance on the failure of Labor to listen to students, parents, unions and teachers on school funding. I firstly want to thank Australian teachers for the incredible work they do. I regret that this motion has not referenced the importance of evidence-based teaching and learning, critical to turning around our declining school standards, which is now a national embarrassment. This is the most critical issue facing Australian parents, carers, teachers and students who are being denied the opportunity to reach their best potential. Why do one in five students in Year 7 have the reading ability of a Grade 4 student? Why did one in three students fail the most recent NAP plan? These are shocking statistics. Proven teaching methods such as explicit instruction must be mandated in every Australian classroom. Why is this critical issue receiving such scant attention from both Labor and the Greens? The biggest disadvantage is not learning to read and write. Over the past two decades, despite a 60 per cent increase in funding, our standards have declined. Twenty years ago, Australia ranked fourth internationally in reading, eighth in science and eleventh in maths. Now we have fallen to sixteenth in reading, seventeenth in science and twenty-ninth in maths. Australia has lost the equivalent of one year's worth of learning over the past two decades. We were once on par with top performing nations such as Singapore. Now the average 15-year-old Singaporean is three years ahead of their Australian counterparts. In its submission to Labor's review on the National School Reform Agreement, the Australian Education Research Organisation has reiterated the importance of reforms to ensure that proven evidence-based teaching methods are adopted in every Australian classroom along with regular student assessment, targeted interventions and continuous database tracking of student progress. I put on the record, under the Coalition, funding doubled from $13 billion to $25.3 billion. But this is and must not be a funding war, but a war to improve student outcomes, to ensure the next generation of Australians can reach for the stars. Under the Gonski needs-based funding model, the Commonwealth is meeting its current obligations, providing 20 per cent and more of the schooling resource standard to government schools. But with the exception of the ACT, the states and territories which run schools are well below 80 per cent. Victoria is only 70 per cent, Queensland 69 per cent and the Northern Territory a dismal 59 per cent. So under Gonski, students in government schools are being shortchanged by the states and the Northern Territory, all by one of these are Labor governments. The Albanese government was elected on a promise to deliver 100 per cent SRS funding, a pathway to full and fair funding. But Labor's pathway has become some fanciful yellow brick road to nowhere. All we have seen is review after review from Education Minister Jason Clare, who has delayed the National School Reform Agreement by one year in a decision that even the Australian Education Union has called a betrayal of underfunded public schools and disadvantaged students. In fact, the budget papers show the Albanese government is cutting $1.2 billion in funding to government schools over the next four years. What hypocrisy from Labor. Where is the investment in better student outcomes or even building boarding schools for Indigenous students in East Arnhem Land and the Pilbara, which have been cruelly axed by this government. So much for listening to Indigenous voices. The big funding challenge facing Australian schools is to ensure that we are investing in the things that will help students and teachers to excel. Evidence-based teaching and learning, fixing the overcrowded curriculum and dramatic improvements in initial teacher education. And I say to this minister, what about the growing teacher shortage crisis? We have a crisis in this country. So many teachers are under pressure with the administrative burden, and yet this minister has done absolutely no nothing to fix 
the teacher shortage crisis, particularly in regional Australia. Our teachers are drowning in work. Principals cannot find teachers to teach their students. It is an absolute disgrace. And in this motion today, I am calling for urgent action from the government to fix the teacher shortage crisis in Australian schools, particularly across regional Australia. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cyril. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Tasmanian public school teachers feel like they've been set up to fail. That's the message I've heard in meetings over the past few weeks. Teachers have sat in front of me with tears in their eyes and told me they just can't do it anymore. They've underfunded, under-resourced and have their backs against the wall. We've got a huge shortage of teachers in Tassie and there are a few reasons why. Some students aren't finishing their degree. Many are dropping out because they can't afford to do placements. They're required to do unpaid full-time work that prevents them from working a paying job at the same time. Some teachers are getting a few years in and burning out. They're using money from their own paycheck to fund classroom activities and buy lunches for kids. Others are leaving the state entirely. How do we keep our best and brightest teachers in Tassie when they can't make more money, when they can make more money by leaving? I don't understand. Teachers want funding to cover the bare minimum. We're not talking about the bells and whistles, just the necessities. The federal government has met its end of the Gonski funding bargain, but the states are dragging their heels. It's not the job of the federal government to reward the states going slow on school funding. States have to cover their share of the bill. It's not up to the federal government to make sure teachers are being paid properly. That's up to the states too. At this rate, Tasmanian schools won't be fully funded until 2027. That's teachers being asked to do more and more with less than we know they need. And while we wait for that to happen over the next four years, we'll see more teachers leave and less teachers starting. How we value our teachers, the key people who shape our children's start to life, says a lot about us as a nation. But it's got to be a team effort with the states pulling their weight because I know I'm in the teacher's corner. Senator O'Neill. Very much, Acting Deputy President. And um, I just want to take the opportunity to indicate how important this debate is this afternoon. And I thank Senator McKim for moving this matter of public importance because it allows me to speak about a subject that is very close to my own heart, which is education as a former teacher and also a teacher of teachers at the University of Newcastle. I know about the transformative power of education in my own life and also giving that opportunity. I want to respond, however, to a couple of comments um, by Senator Henderson in her contribution, and I know that she's a spokesperson for education for the government that just was, that just was for the last 10 years. And she talks about cuts. And let me tell you about being in estimates here in this building and watching Senator Birmingham defend cuts after cuts. A, a reform agreement that was made with my state, the state of New South Wales, which allowed the state to count the cost of busing kids to school as part of the educational contribution. That's why the situation that Senator Tyrrell was just talking about, where teachers are buying lunches for kids, going out and getting paper for them to be able to work with. That's why we're where we are. It's because terrible things were done for the point of difference in terms of funding. And I just want to warn that these simplistic solutions that have were the, the, the signature of the previous government, you know, we must have explicit instruction. We must be mandating that that occurs for every student. Well, let me tell you, the evidence base is that every learner learns in a slightly different way. There is no way anybody would dare come in here and say to a builder, I'm sorry, I'm only going to uh, let you, I'm going to mandate the tools that you can use to build a house. I'm going to mandate that. You must do it the way that I say, even though I'm not an expert and I don't know. Teachers are experts and they're sick and tired of politicians playing with them, telling them what to do when they don't have the expertise or the professional knowledge and they diminish the complex work that teachers do to mandating the sorts of instructions that we've just heard repeated here again. Funding obviously is critical in making schools able to do the best thing that they can do. But what's most important is what that funding does. We heard in Senator Henderson's words that you know, 
We have to have a war to improve this sector, the education sector. We don't need a war. We need the sort of vision that allowed Henry Parts to establish the concept of public education in the first place. The sorts of buildings that we see were aspirational. They gave hope and heart to people in schools. That's what we need. We don't need more of this let's play divisive different games and politicians telling teachers what to do from this building. We should watch and observe. We should take the data. We should obviously notice when things are going wrong and we need to respond carefully. But we shouldn't be mandating anything for the multitude of needs that, assist, uh, that exist in schools across this country. Now, the current National Schools Reform Agreement was signed off in 2018 by the Morrison government. Now, this is an agreement with which every year that passed has become an illustration of a wasted decade of missed opportunities in school education. The Productivity Commission was damning, damning in its assessment of that agreement, pointing out last year that the former government's plan lacked real targets and it was missing very practical reforms needed to help prevent students from falling behind. The results of 10 years of educational supposed leadership in this place by the Liberal National Party was that more than 86,000 students were failing to meet either basic literacy or numeracy standards. And why are teachers leaving? Because they're being berated, deprofessionalised, discarded. And they're walking away from really powerful and important work because they've been underpaid and underfunded. And as a senator for New South Wales, I want to give voice to the thanks of my teaching colleagues across that state who are so happy that there's been a change of government there as well. And I want to acknowledge my colleagues there, Prue Carr, the Minister for Education, and Premier Minns, who are going to lead a, rev a revolutionary transformation and a lift of investment in that state, in our students. I'm pleased to say that this government here in Canberra is getting on with the job of dealing with the legacy of decline that was accurately documented by Senator Henderson. But it all happened on their watch. On funding, we went to the election with a commitment to work with states and territories to get every school funded to 100 per cent of its fair funding level. Fairness in funding for every Australian student, it's simply what we have to do. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I commend Senator McKim for bringing this motion, and I endorse the words of my colleague, Senator Orman Payne, in, in relation to the basic minimum for public schools. There's been a lot of discussion about what the National School Reform Agreement should have um, when it's renegotiated for the next five years, but let's be clear. The Greens say the minimum standard we will accept for the next National School Reform Agreement is that there is 100 per cent funding of the SRS at the start of the next agreement, meaning by January 2025. Not at the end of the five-year agreement, not halfway through the five-year agreement, but at the start of the agreement there needs to be 100 per cent of SRS funding. And what is SRS funding? The schooling resource standard. Well, the schooling resource standard isn't some sort of Rolls-Royce funding. It is the bare minimum funding needed so that 80 per cent of kids who go to that school get across the line. It's not something that we should be aspirationally looking for. It's the bare minimum. And I, I want to be clear that on behalf of the Greens, we say once we get to 100 per cent of the SRS, we then want to get 100 per cent of the kids across the line and the funding needed to get 100 per cent of the kids across the line. But this school resourcing standard um, isn't that kind of aspirational goal. It's the bare minimum. What's, what's, what's absolutely disgusting from a country that has broadly Labor state and, fed, and, and Labor federal governments is that at the moment public schools on average only receive 87 per cent of that minimum funding, 87 per cent. And, and a big chunk of that, of course, is a decade of underfunding from the coalition. A decade of underfunding from the coalition federally, and, 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 and instead of talking about what public schools really need, which is respect for teachers, pay for teachers, proper funding for the schools, we've had the better part of a decade of culture wars from the coalition uh, trying to rewrite the curriculum 
from the federal parliament rather than do the work the federal parliament should do for public schools, which is fund our teachers, fund our schools and support our, our, our kids going through their education. The um, public education is, is the glue that holds any equitable society together. A, a, a fully funded, world-class public education system is, is what marks out equitable, uh, open societies from the kind of increasingly divided societies we see around the world. And, and as a Green senator, I rate, my colleagues rate, our team rates public education as one of those core indicators for the health of any society. And, and while this government, and let's be clear, the coalition before them, um, have done everything they can to come up with every excuse possible to say that they can't meet the bare minimum funding. The rest of the country is looking at this parliament and saying, well, hang on a minute. You're willing to legislate for stage three tax cuts and give a quarter of a, billion, of a trillion dollars, largely to those people who've already got more than enough. So there's a quarter of a trillion dollars to give to people on 200 grand or more, but you haven't got the money for public education. Or, or the coalition and Labor come together and say, oh, we've got half a trillion dollars to spend on nuclear submarines that we don't need that make us less safe. Half a trillion dollars on nuclear submarines, but we haven't got any money for public education. Oh, we can't close the gap on public education. So let, let's, let's look at what that means. That means this parliament is perfectly comfortable with public school teachers having to buy the basics for their lessons with public school teachers having to pay out of their inadequate salaries to get their kids, some of their kids, some lunch money, with parents across the country increasingly paying for the basic teaching tools in public schools because there's not enough money. It's not that there's not enough money. It's that the priorities are cooked. Tax cuts for the wealthy, nuclear submarines to fund war, but where's the money for public education? So when we're looking forward over the next few months. We're looking at what the next national school reform agreement will put in place. Let's make it 100 per cent funding from day one of the agreement, then the Greens will give it a tick. Thank you. Uh, the time for discussion has expired.